So you here, you don't care about whether it's singular or plural. Uh, in Old English, you care, right? You care when say, say, or that uh, were used to indicate the um, number, the gender, and also the case. But when you use, when you come to use the word that, which is the neuter case, right? Uh, you don't care about the number anymore. And all of these are examples of grammaticalized items because, by the cause of, because, because, cause, and so on. Right? And this is the tendencies in many languages of the world for a lexical item to become grammatical item. So today we'll look at the word go, right? And all of these are also grammaticalized items, right? Complex prepositions, prepositions that are longer than one word, right? Prepositions that are longer than one word. All of these involve um, grammaticalization. Uh, another example that we looked at last time was in place of, right? In the physical place of something, X is in the physical place of Y, for example. But then as the expression became grammaticalized more and more, um, you have the meaning of instead of or on behalf of rather than a physical place, right? So for example, a robot goes to school in place of homebound students like that. Not in the physical, phase, uh, physical place, but in the capacity of or instead of. On the top of, we also look at this, right, that uh, in the first, uh, perhaps the first few stages of the development, you have the top being the head noun, right? The top of the table, which is the noun like this, the top of the table. But then speakers reanalyze this to become one phrase, right? On the top of as one prepositional phrase, right? Plus the table. So the table has become the head noun there. And then on top of, this is the morphological reduction, right? You take off the D because now speakers analyze this as one chunk of preposition on top of. And then the table is the head noun. And then the final stage is atop the table, right? Involve, involving phonetic erosion also, right? On top of, atop, right? And then top is gone, ah, and then off is gone also. Now, I have this to show you the picture. Let's see in relation to the word top of. Now you will see two refrigerators here. Um, so if we use on the top of, let's say place the pen, place the marker here, on the top of, on the top of the fridge. Where should it be? On the top of. Here, right? on the top of. In this case, the word top is still, right, is still the head noun, right? Remember, grammaticalization involves diversion. So you still have the old expression plus the new expression going their own ways, right? Now on the top of the fridge, place it on top, the top of the fridge is here, right? So the top is the highest place, you guys know, right? The, that's the meaning of the word top. Now, if you have a refrigerator uh, lying on the floor in this condition, where's the top? If we are talking about the top, then it has to be somewhere the other side that, that, that the picture doesn't show, right? Same top, right, same top. If we're talking about the top of. Now, if I say on top of, on top of the fridge, on top of, this is a grammaticalized item already, right? So on top could be here which is not the original top, right? So that's the difference. So on top, like let's say, oh, I get additional pay on top of my salary, right? On top of my salary, that's the grammaticalized item, right? Uh, doesn't mean that the, the additional pay is on the top, on the head of my salary, it's not like that, but on top meaning just above, right? Just above. But it doesn't have to be the real top, the physical top, right? So that's the meaning of uh, that's the difference between on the top of and on top of. Right? Now we'll look at another example, which is the verb to go, and look at the process of grammaticalization. So let's come back to the PowerPoint slide here. So be going to, 
be going to is a future marker, right? Be going to is a future marker. And you use it typically when you have um, some intention, right? Some intention or some evidence is going to rain because you see dark clouds and stuff like that. So that's be going to. Now this is like, I don't have old English examples uh, because it's hard to find. Uh, but here, I show you similar things in modern English, okay? So this is the kind of uh, path, pathway of development of Go. So I went to Harlem. Harlem is a place, for example. So I went to Harlem. So this is the real sense of Go, right? The, the verb sense, the verb sense, this is the original, right? Original meaning of Go. So to move, Go is to move from one place to another place. So A shows you the real sense, the concrete sense of moving, right, from one place to another place, right? What is B? What about B? I went to Harlem to visit my aunt. The only difference here is you see the to visit my aunt. We call that the purpose clause, right, purpose. I went to Harlem in order to, so as to, with the purpose of seeing my aunt, right? So still, but here, went to Harlem is still a, um, a verb, a motion verb, moving from one place to another in B, but you have a purpose clause to visit my aunt, right? Now, in number C, as, as speakers use these two constructions, with or without the purpose clause, often and more often and more often, right? In number C, they can leave out the place. They can leave out the place. So keeping only the purpose clause, I went to visit my aunt. I went to visit my aunt, right? Leaving out the destination or the goal of the movement, right? So as speakers use the same construction more and more, right? Now in number D, it's a different tense, right? It's a different tense. I'm going to visit my aunt, plus the purpose clause, right? I'm going to, here, uh, has the ing form, right? Has the aspect, progressive aspect. And when it's used with the purpose clause, it shows your intention, right? I'm going to visit my aunt. Although the meaning of go is still moving, right? I'm going to visit my aunt. Now, in number E, what is different is when you add the word tomorrow or not, or the context allows it, right? When you add the word tomorrow, go here from intention, right? From intention, a little bit becomes a future marker because you can put in the word tomorrow, right? And then you can also leave out the purpose clause to visit my aunt. So at least in the stage D and E, and in stage D, D and E, you see the grammaticalized, right? Grammaticalized meaning of the word go. At least there is semantic bleaching there, from go to something that's about, uh, that's the, uh, that, con that conveys your intention or something that you want to do in the future, right? In number F, what about number F? I'm going to like it. This is real, right? Full-fledged, full-fledged grammaticalized item because going here is no longer a verb to go. Right? E, you can argue that, well, going, going to, uh, put to there, I'm going to visit. So going here is kind of ambiguous, right? A ambiguous between going, which means go, and then to visit, which is the purpose clause. That's ambiguous. So speakers kind of get confused around here, right? But then number F, this is a completely different sense of go because it doesn't mean to go anymore, right? It's real future marker. And like, like here is your emotion, right? It's unlike to visit my aunt. You cannot have the purpose of liking, right? So F, to like it is not a purpose anymore. But, but it looks similar, right? To plus a verb. So a speaker get confused and they an reanalyze the structure. Number G, it's going to rain. This is altogether different, right? Because here the subject is it. It cannot go. It's, I don't know what the weather, something like that. So here is real, really a grammatical marker. And H, I'm going to go there for sure. Now you have two verbs in the same, uh, same sentence, right? Going, the first one is a future marker. The second one is the verb. So which means that they go their own separate ways, right? Number H. 
And number I, I'm gonna go phonetic reduction, phonetic erosion. Even some people say I gonna go. So if I give you this kind of data on the final, can you explain what's going on? Uh, tell me that, you know, there, where the semantic bleaching happens and why it happens, how it happens, and also where, speaker, where speakers reanalyze the clauses and uh, where the item becomes the real full-fledged grammaticalized item. So something like this. So I want to show that the concept can be applied to all the languages in the world. Not only English, but every, every language has grammaticalization. So we should study. So we'll go over this. Okay, these sentences are from my textbook. So my translation, my translation here is not idiomatic, or, or I try to be as idiomatic as I could because, because sometimes we don't use the verb kada or the verb go in the senses that you guys use, okay? So I try to be idiomatic here. So I cannot translate everything out as go, okay? Because in English, we don't, just don't say that. Now, uh, where's my pointer? Oh, here. So, so this client is semantic bleaching, right? So this is semantic bleaching. So this client is semantic bleaching. So the meaning goes from more concrete, right? So concrete here to more abstract, right? Semantic bleaching. Bleach is to fade, right? So the meaning goes from concrete to abstract from person. For example, person going, uh, going in the sense of moving from one place to another place, to object going, activity, time, or quality, right? More abstract. So that's the climb here. That's what I want to show from 1 to 16. So 1, na, manjo, kalke, right? So I leave or I go now. This is the concrete sense, right? Concrete sense with me as a subject, person, going, leaving, right? I'll leave now, like that. Now, the second one, 시내 서점에 체크 사러 갔다, right? So I went to the downtown bookstore, sojom is bookstore, 체크 to buy, to buy book. So this is still physical, right? Physical, but here, just same as in English, you have the purpose clause, right? 사러, 아오로 가다, right? 아오로 오다. Like that. Number three, uh, inside, we don't say the going train. We say the departing train, the running train, something like that. So I cannot translate it out as inside the going train. So inside the running train, inside the going train. Now it's not the person anymore, but it's the object, right? The train, uh, yolja here. But still, has the meaning of moving from one place to another place, right? Number four, in your, into your pocket. Noe jumani, sokuro tolakan neton. Right? So, into your pocket, my money went. So, again, this is number four, which is the object, right? Object. So, the object of, where is the object here? Ton, right? Uh, went into your um, jumani, to your pocket, right? But it still involves the meaning of moving. But is it clear or not? You know, money doesn't have legs, right? Money cannot move. So this is more abstract, right? More abstract, uh, more abstract. At least then one, two, three, right? At least then one, two, three. But it still involves some kind of movement, right? Transfer of ownership, for example, right? Number five. I went to, I visited Pyongwon, right? Visited the hospital and check out Joaquin no has soil. So, kaso, right? In this case, you involve, um, there is the movement, physical movement. However, you use it with another verb, right? Chacha, chacha kaso, right? Chacha kada. So, you start to use it in a serial verb construction. You guys know serial verb construction? Serial verb construction is where you use 
many verbs in a row, you use many verbs in a row without any connector, like come see me in English. We have that kind of construction also. But the meaning here is visit, right? Visit, chacha, right? The, the, the main meaning is chacha, right? Uh, number six. Number six, if we can't settle the issue, we have to go with majority rule, right? We have to go in the direction, pang hyang in the direction of um, what the majority wants, right? So in this case, the ka is not movement anymore, right? But perhaps agreement, right? Agreement. We have to uh, maybe activity, right? Activity, our activity, whatever we agree upon, we will have to go in that direction, the, re the direction of what the majority of the people want. Right? So this is activity. Where is that? Right here. Same as in number, <laughs> sorry, number seven. 식당에 요즘도 잘 나가죠, right? So the restaurant is doing well, right, nowadays. Now, Naka is not going somewhere, right? But the operation, the activity, right? So six and seven are the same. It's difficult for a way cooking Saram like me <laughs> because there are so many senses. So if you don't know Naka Da here, how do you know that it's activity rather than it's the go really going? The restaurant has legs, right? Uh, number eight, uh, if we had gone the other way, if we had chosen the other way of action, like that, right? We don't have to live uh, in a hardship or live a life of hardship like this and so on, right? So in this case, uh, the katta is here, right? So not, not physical, not physical, right? Not physical movement of going, leaving one place to another place, but perhaps also activity. Right, perhaps also activity, just like number six and seven. Number nine, this is even more abstract. Uh, if I ask that person, uh, what, uh, how old is your daughter? That person can answer, oh, next year she will go to school, right? She. Like, Tani Mim Yasaliya, like that, right? So, well, how old is your daughter, like that? So you, that person can answer, next year she'll go to school, right? So in this case, it's not physical going, but attending school, right? So activity also. So activity also in uh, six, seven, eight, and nine, right? Number 10 is difficult. We cooking people don't understand this. The ribs were broken into two pieces, so why do you use ka here? Because, because to wake up in, there's no movement of anything, right? The, the ribs cannot go anywhere, right? <laughs> Difficult. <laughs> but perhaps here, uh, maybe, I don't know how to explain, but perhaps the, the eyesight of the person noticing the action of the ribs broken into pieces. So the, the movement of the ribs broke being broken into two pieces or three pieces, perhaps that's a movement, right? But this is difficult for, for, for non-native speaker to understand. And number 11 also, trust has been broken, faith has been broken, that's difficult for foreigners also. Um, why do you use the word go, right? No movement at all, uh, it's like some, something is gone, right? So it's 10, 10, 11, and 12, perhaps, uh, they are quality, right? So, quality of trust, some very abstract things, like number 12, ehe ka an ka, why you are understanding, don't go anywhere, why it doesn't go anywhere, or, so difficult for foreigners, they are idiomatic, right? They are idiomatic because they are more grammaticalized, right, than, than the first, second, third, fourth. In 13, uh, the, the white house or the blue house that you call, call it, right? It doesn't approve it, right? Same thing as 12, uh, the approval doesn't go, right? The approval doesn't go. Same thing as, as 12. So here is the approval, right? Um, which is difficult because in English, we don't say it like this, right? 
Number 14, 14 is really difficult, uh, not difficult because we study this in class. We have ao uh, kada, which is like um, a continuative aspect, aspect marker, which means that uh, waste keeps piling up, right? Waste keeps piling up um, in our beautiful environment. So, saida plus kada, right? So this is a real grammatical marker, right? Because ka here has no sense of going, moving, or anything at all, but the event keeps happening, right? Continuative aspect. Same as number 15. Uh, right? <laughs> There's no translation of go in English. You cannot translate it with go, the word go. You have to say like, I'm in freaking pain, I'm in f ing pain, or something like that, right? So here, ka, ao kada, same thing, right? Continuative aspect. And 16 and 17 are the same thing, right? Continuative and progressive. Two things happen at the same time, right? Pua ka myon so, ao kada, plus myon so, right? Uh, two things happen at the same time. Playing football is good, but at the same time, you should read, you should study too, and so on. I will do the competition, I will join the competition, and at the same time, we'll also do the body conditioning, preparing myself, keeping myself in check, and so on, right? So two things happening at the same time for 16 and 17. So at least for mm, 14 to 17, you have ka as the real uh, grammatical marker, right? Aspect marker. Right, because the word car, kada in these sentences doesn't mean any movement, any uh, transfer of place at all, right? But you use them in the sense of continuative or progressive of one event or two events at the same time. So difficult. Uh, 14 and 17, not difficult for foreigners because foreigners study these constructions like this, and they tell us the, the meaning, but 10 to 13, very difficult, because they are too abstract, right? Okay, so if I show you examples like this, can you explain what's happening according to uh, the, the pathway or the steps of change that we talked about in class? Um, I cannot explain the phonetic erosion in these cases, because I don't know much about Korean. So I'll leave it to, to you guys to, to do that. So more or less the same as going to, but uh, you don't use kada. Well, maybe you use it in the, in the continuative sense, right, for something that will be going on in the future, heading, heading into the future. So similar to going to, which is a future marker. Um, another example is the word since. You know that the word since in English, this is uh, in our PowerPoint file, the word since in English has two meanings, right? The time, preposition, right, the time, since, this is the original meaning, right? Since indicate time, right? Since indicate time. Then to cause, so what happens after is a result. So how, how did this happen? Now, first, it started out as the time, right? I have learned Japanese since we last met, right? So that's clearly time. There cannot be any causal uh, meaning there. But then people start to get confused when since is moved into the front part of the sentence. Since Susan left him, John has been very miserable. Now, in this case, you don't know that <laughs> since here is because or since here is the time, right? From the time Susan left him. So there's the ambiguity here. So the ambiguity here gives rise to the uh, causal meaning that follows afterward. Since you are not coming with me, I have to go alone. In this case, it's clearly causal, right? So the, the important step seems to be here, right? That when the meaning is ambiguous, when the meaning is ambiguous, see speakers start to reanalyze, right? And understand, speakers start to understand the construction in a different way, right? And now you have a new meaning coming out of that, right? just like the word to go. And points to take home include semantic bleaching is always present. The lexical items become more and more abstract semantically. 
reanalysis, um, analyze one uh, construction in a different way, right? Uh, perhaps by grouping, grouping different words together, right? And the new grammatical will have, uh, will show phono phonological reduction, phonetic erosion, and finally will become a suffix, right? Um, this, in this case, I showed you the last example of the word instead of, instead of, uh, which is a complex proposition. Uh, it comes from in the stead of. Stead here is, stead here used to be a lexical item, which means place. Same thing as in place of, in the state of, in the place of, like that. And then, uh, you know, semantic bleaching happens. Um, reanalysis happened so that we have things like he came instead of staying home, right? In this case, there's no physical place at all. Instead of, here's like activity, right? Instead of, plus <coughs> ing verb, right? Rather than a physical place in that state. Um, to show you, before we leave this topic, to show you what reanalysis happened, let's take a look of in place of. Let's take that example. So in place of is a prepositional phrase, right? Or on top of, on the top of is the same thing. So on the top of, so this is a prepositional phrase, so it has this kind of structure, right? So preposition on, and then NP, right, determiner, the, N is top, this is the head noun, and then prepositional phrase, preposition of, let's say on the top of Krista's head, whatever. So NP, Krista, like this. So this is the original, right? Now the reanalysis, what is reanalysis? So now we say that the top here is no longer the head noun, right? This is the head noun, right? So the top is no longer a head noun, which means that the top is just one prepositional phrase on top of, like this. And then the NP is still the NP, Krista, like this. So that's what we mean by reanalysis. So speakers reanalyze this part, which consists of on as a preposition, the as a determiner, top as a head noun, just to this kind of thing, right? On top of as one, one chunk. So this is what we call reanalysis. Right? So re you can do that with going to also. Going as a verb, as a head verb, to as a purpose clause, but then going to as one word, right? As one expression. It will be complicated because maybe some of you don't have the syntax background. So going to V, VP to V, going. And then two is like a purpose clause, right? So P here and then there's another verb there. And then two and going, they reanalyzed and then speakers uh, group them together as going to, as like to be going to. So we finish early modern English. Now we will go into American English, right? Because the reason why I placed this here is because American English came into being at the end of the early modern English period, right? Because at the end of the early modern in English period, you remember there is global, uh, not globalization, but there is colonization, right? Colonization of um, many areas around the world by the European people, by British people, right? So American English is best discussed at this time, right? So first we'll talk about the development of American English and then, um, what else? And then the history and development and then characteristics. But here I made the PowerPoint too detailed because um, I thought we should study everything, but <laughs> as, <laughs> as detailed as possible, but then I think that it's too much. It might be too much for you guys. So, Sakwan, why? Why you agree readily? So, what we'll do is we'll simplify this thing, okay? So here, let's go over this. Now, I, the way I divided it uh, is a five period, right? Five sub-periods of American English, starting from the colonial period, then to the continental expansion period, to the uh, independent status period. 
So five periods, I think that's too much for you guys. Now what we'll do is just, we'll be happy with three, okay, three. <laughs> so I'll write it out for you. So three is good. Because um, you can, if you are interested in this, you can go to sociolinguistics. So the first period is, of course, always colonial period, right? Second period is continental expansion. And third period is, and the third period, let's see, the international period. So we are on the same page, right? That on the PowerPoint slide, you will have more detailed, right? More detailed representation, more detailed classification of these different periods. But just to help you make it simpler, so we'll just go with three, right? Continental, start out the same as in the PowerPoint uh, file, and then continental expansion, which uh, if we were to divide that in detail, it would be many, uh, let's say decades, many uh, intervals, right, under here, and then international period. So the colonial period, uh, when, so let's go with the colonial period, so. You guys study uh, American literature, right, Nimun. Right, so with Yun Sang Ho, something name. So you should know better, right, than me. So the colonial period is when, when European settlers, right, uh, most most of who most of whom were British people, right, came to settle down, right, on the um, let's see American continent. But the first. Of course, there were colonies before this, but they didn't survive. So the first one, uh, people, historians, historians said that, oh, let's, let's take this as the first one. So the settlers came to Jamestown, Virginia as the first colony, right, as the first colony. Of course, there were before that, there were colonies before that, but they didn't survive, like Roanoke, Virginia, and so on, right? So the first one was in Jamestown, right? And then you have other peoples coming from uh, mainly, mainly in the first period, uh, mainly from England, right? And people who came there from different backgrounds, right? So people who came to settle down in Massachusetts. Mm, I think I should show you the picture. Uh, where's my picture? So Massachusetts is around here. So there's a different group. Jamestown is around here, right, which is a different group. So there are many different groups of people coming to the U.S. in the colonial period, most of whom were British people. But they are from different cultures. They are from different uh, regions back in England, right? So, for example, people who came to settle down in Boston, for example, Boston or Massachusetts here, they were Puritans. You, you should know this from American literature, right? Puritan people. So they were... Uh, they were conservative, they were religious people who escaped uh, religious prosecution in England, right? And there is a different group who came to settle down in uh, Pennsylvania, Quakers. Have you heard of this term, the Quakers, right? They practiced a different uh, sect of Christianity. So they also escaped um, religious prosecution and they settled down in different place. So what this means for us linguistically is that um, along the East Coast here, especially this part, along the East Coast, you'll see many, many dialectal varieties, right? Many dialectal varieties because people who came from England and other countries in Europe, they were from different cultures, they believed in different things, and they were from different regions of England, right? So they would stick together in this place, in this place, in this place, so they carry with them their own dialects from back home. Right? They carry with them their own dialect from back home. But in the second period, the uh, continental expansion, people start to move west, right? People start to move west like this, right? And under that mindset, have you heard of the term manifest destiny? 
when you study American literature, manifest destiny. Um, which means that uh, manifest destiny is like a mindset under here. Manifest destiny. People who, who teach literature should, should, should teach you this concept. So it's the mindset in the 19th century. This is like around 18th to 19th century. This is from 16th to, to 18th century, right? So the mindset that, that if the US, if America was to become a, a good country, right, or a successful country, we have to move westward. Bring, bringing light uh, to uh, dispel darkness, right? Bringing civilization to dispel undeveloped areas like that. So it's like their own mission to move westward, right? And when they move westward, right? We talk about the original settlers. When they move westward, their dialects, right? Their dialects, their varieties seem to merge, seem to merge. So in the west of the US, you have uh, fewer varieties of English than along the East Coast, right, than along the East Coast. Because as they move westward, the dialect seems to myth, uh, the dialect seem to, to be mixed, right? And also, as they move westward, they came into contact with different groups of people. For example, the Spanish, right, the Spanish people in um, Texas, in the Southwest, or uh, they, came into contact with Asian uh, immigrants, like Chinese people, Japanese people, during that time also, during this continental expansion also. So um, the, dialects on the, the dialects on the West Coast um, are not as um, different as, obviously different as along the East Coast, right? And the international period, this is like from the 19th century to now, right? From the 19th century to now. So what is important is that now we have the second or the third wave even. The third wave, people talk about the third wave of immigration from European countries. For, for example, German, German Jew, Jewish people or Italian people. Millions and millions of Italian people came to live in the US, for example. So here you even came into contact with more and more linguistic um, situations. So we borrow a lot of words from those languages. Right? So three main periods for us. Now let's look at examples of linguistic impact or linguistic effects. So in the colonial period, right? We talked about Puritans, uh, plantation owners, right? Plantation owners, what they need? What they need was labor, right? So they brought slaves from Africa, for example, right? Slaves from Africa, and slaves from Africa developed their own language, right? They brought with them the languages that they spoke back there, and then when they came into contact with uh, the masters who own the plantation, right? they have to come up with some kind of um, English lingua franca, some kind of English, a uh, broken English in order to communicate with their masters, for example. So you have a different uh, kind of English developed out of that, right? And also, in this period, um, you came into contact with um, Native American people, right? Native American people who were already there, right, who were already there. Now, they also have names to call things, right, names to call things like animals that um, European people didn't even know, right, chipmunk, right, moose, for example, or possum, right, or skunk, right, these are names of animals that um, we borrow from American Indian languages, right, and then trees, hickory, and then other objects, pecan, like uh, things that you can eat, and so on. So these are all from American Indian, right? There are hundreds and hundreds of American Indian languages, right? And also French, uh, because 
you know, there were colonies, French colonies, Spanish colonies, Dutch colonies before, even before uh, the settlement of the British people along the East Coast, right? So we borrow these words from French, caribou, gopher, uh, pumpkin, jambalaya, that's like the native um, food of New Orleans, right? Bio, uh, creek or river, small river, and so on. And Dutch, so we have all of these words, coleslaw, cookie, dam, Santa Claus, sleigh, from Dutch. So Dutch, Dutch people settled down in Pennsylvania, for example. And we talked about this, right? So as you expand westward, you purchased Louisiana, you got Texas, you got California. So you came into contact with different groups of people. Louisiana, French, right? French, Texas, Spanish, California with perhaps um, maybe uh, if you go down south, California, you have uh, Spanish, and also, and you also have Chinese, right? Chinese settlers came to the U.S. pretty early, right? Um, so we borrow all of these words from from those groups. Okay. Um, this is important. So in the period of continental expansion, people started to feel nationalistic patriotic, right? Because they think that, okay, after we did the Declaration of the Independence in 1776, so we should be one nation. We should be different. We should be distinct from Britain, right, back home. So this guy, Noah Webster, this guy, Noah Webster, <coughs> he was one of the leaders of spelling changes and grammatical reform for American standards, right? Because of the nationalistic feeling, right? Nationalism, patriotism. So he said that we should have our own standards of spelling, of grammar, right? Because we are different. We are a different group of people than the British people. So he wrote many, many books of grammar and dictionaries. So the Webster guy here is the Webster dictionary that we are using today. So he proposed many spelling changes uh, America, in American Dictionary of the English Language. There are so many editions of this, right? There are so many editions of that. So um, some of the spelling reform proposals got accepted, but some did not, right? So the things that got accepted by the people there include things like O-U-R in British English, now came to be spelled as O-R. So color, C-O-L-O-U-R, C-O-L-O-R in American English. So this is uh, one of the accepted changes, right? Uh, double to single, traveler, double L, to traveler, one L, R-E, next one, R-E to E-R, center with the R-E to center, E-R, Q-U-E to C-K or K, check, C-H-E-Q-U-E -E, um, to C-H-E-C-K and so on, right? So these are cha the changes that got accepted. And we, we use them nowadays. But there are also changes that were not accepted. Um, the IZ or P-R-O-O-V or schedule, the word for S-C-H-E, right? The schedule or tongue for, for your tongue. So these are proposals that didn't get accepted. So most got accepted, but these are examples that of the exceptions, right? And there are two problems with his dictionary. One is that um, it's based on New England pronunciation, right? You know, New England pronunciation uh, were settled down by, mostly by Puritans, right? By Puritan people. And they were R-less people. You guys know R-less? I'll write it out here. R-less people. Are less. There's rotism. Rotism. You guys know this term, right? Rotism. Rhotic is when you pronounce the R by curling your tongue, right? So the Puritan people, they were R-less people, meaning in this what they call post-vocalic R. Post is after, vocal is vowel, right? The R after a vowel is gone, R less, 
R less, no R, right? In post-vocalic position, after a vowel. For example, car, that's after a vowel, right? K-A-R, car, like this. So they will have R or no R, no R, right? Because they are R less people. Whereas in other areas, they were R4. There's R less and R4 people. With the exception of New York, New Yorker. So Puritan people or people who settled down in um, along the New England area, Maine, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, that area, we call it New England. England that's new, right? So that's one of the first colonies, right? Now they are R less. So car will be pronounced as car or Harvard that people made fun of. I parked my car in the Harvard yard like that. So it would be pronounced like without the R, like that. Right? So Webster's dictionary is based on this kind of pronunciation, which doesn't really reflect American, typical American pronunciation because other settlers who came from Scotland, Irish people who came to settle down along different uh, areas um, in the East Coast, they have R, awful. Irish people, Scottish people, they are awful people. And as they move westward, they were still, they retain the R. So this is one of the exception areas, right, which is R-less. R-less is also in Britain, right? If you study British English, it's R-less without the R after the vowel. And etymologies are not very accurate, right? Meaning the etymology, history of words are not very accurate. And uh, this is the, this slide refers to the same period that we group under continental expansion, right? So with Webster, with other people, they are trying to, they are trying to establish American standards. Clearing one throat, meaning cleaning, cleaning and organizing things in American, American ways, using American standards, clipping, referring to cutting words shorter, right? Americans like shorter words like that. And you have these writers, which I will just skip, right? Because you should know them from American literature, Nimun, and um, also this is under continental expansion. Um, during World War I, there is this period where people feel very patriotic to America. So they hate the role of Germany, for example. So they try to get rid, they try to purify American English um, by um, eliminate, eliminate, eliminating all the German words. So sauerkraut, which is Dutch, German, which is like the salad, right, that you eat with fried chicken like that, uh, German miso. That's a type of deceit, hamburger, steak. So these are all, all words from German, right? So they try to purify the English language by avoiding the use of these terms. So they have things like liberty cabbage, liberty miso, Salisbury steak, instead of all of these German words. Right? And then this is under our international period, right? So here you have a lot of people moving, the third wave of immigrants, the Italian people, Chinese, Japanese people coming in here, right? And as America, um, as America was becoming the major power, right, one of the major powers of the world, so American English dominates, right, the world. Um, in textbook, the, the manuals, like, uh, grammar manuals, everything is written using American English, even more than British manuals, right? So that's the history, that's the short history that you should know, right? Now, I'll talk about this part in detail because it's important. Accents and dialects of U.S. English. I will first define what dialect is and then what accent is. So dialect, people use, uh, or in Korean is saturi, right? So people tend to look at the word dialect negatively, right? Because people tend to think that dialect is like something rural, something rustic, 
something that's not standard, right? However, in linguistic terms, uh, dialect is just a variety of a language, a variety of a language. Variety is a very neutral term, right? Often associated with a particular region, so you have a regional dialect, right? Regional dialect. So if you live in this area, you speak like people from that area. For example, we call it regional dialect or a subsection of a larger language community. So it could be sociolect, meaning if you are from this particular social class, if you are from this ethnic group, right? If you are African American, you would speak like African American, like that. So, so your dialect could be based on where you live, regional dialect, or other kinds of your social, um, social, let's say, social groups that you are a member of. Uh, ethnic group, or social class, or age group even, age group, or gender, men or women, right? So here, dialect is a very neutral term, which indicates a variety of language, right? Not good, not bad, just a variety. Why one variety is different in some ways from, a diff from another variety, right? So it's regionally or socially distinctive, right? Distinctive means that it's clearly different than a, another variety, right? And dialects vary in relatively minor aspect of their pronunciation, right? Vocabulary and grammar. So in other words, people still understand each other, mostly, most of the time. So that's the key. So a dialect is a dialect because people can understand each other. So Seoul people, for example, can understand people from Busan, from Daegu, from other places. So we call that dialects, right, of Korean. So understanding is the key. Mutual understanding is the key. Mutual intelligibility is the key. Of, be, of something being a dialect, right? So if the differences are pronunciation, we call that accent, right? So accent is like part of the dialect, right? But dialects could be different in terms of vocabulary and grammar also. So in this sense, British English is one dialect of English, right? American English is one dialect of English. And under American English, you have several dialects, right? depending on how you want to classify those dialects. Regional dialects in the US or social dialects in the US. right? So mutual intelligibility is the key. So if people don't understand each other, it means that it's a different language, right? not different dialects. And sometimes political issues come into play also. You know, when we refer to Chinese, do you speak Chinese? For example, do you speak Chinese? You know that people in different parts of China, they cannot communicate with each other, right? Hong Kong people, they pronounce words totally different way, even though they are based on the same letters, right? Based on the same characters. Hong Kong uh, Chinese and Mandarin Chinese, they are totally different and they cannot understand each other. So in linguistic sense, it's not, uh, Hong Kong English is not, uh, Hong Kong Chinese is not a dialect of Chinese, right? Because there's no mutual intelligibility. However, in political terms, because now it's the same China, it's the same country, people think of them as dialects of the same language, still calling them Chinese, but in fact, they are not even the same language, right? And variety is the most neutral term that we can use to avoid, uh, to avoid the use of dialect as a negative term. Right? And standard English, doesn't matter if it's standard American English, standard British, standard Australian. Standard English is also a dialect of English, right? This is not based on region. This is not based on your social class. But it's based on, perhaps, what you are trained to do. So if you receive education, then you do academic writing. If you receive education as second language learners, you use standard English. So it's a dialect, right? That is kind of um, passed on because of education and passed on because people want to have prestige, want to feel prestige that comes with standard English. And that comes with the use of 
English in public domains, right? In science, in law, in politics, in religion, used by educated speakers. So standard English is also one dialect, right? And in linguistic sense, it's not better, it's not more intelligent than other varieties of English, right? Because it's just one, one dialect. But it's just that it just happens to be a dialect that is used in education, first language or second language, or, or in public domains, in most public domains, right? In private or in personal domains, people might switch back to their hometown dialects, for example. Right? Or girls will switch to girl talk and so on. Right? Um, so dialect variations can be based on some social factors such as region, such as social class, ethnicity, Asian American, uh, African American, Spanish American, Mexican American, and so on. Style, formal, informal, right? Uh, newspaper style, magazine style, right? Or academic style, age, what age group are you, right? If you are young, if you want to be cute, you want to use like many, many cute words, like let's, something like that. Sex or gender, girls will talk differently uh, from men and so on, right? Um, so I think this is a good place to stop because next time we'll go with region and we'll go with social class, right? Of Ameri dialects as dialects of American English. So we'll come back and continue this topic, American regional dialects on Monday.